Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm the geographer Lazi and coming up in today's newscast. An Israeli man who was injured in a terror stabbing attack two weeks ago succumbs to his wounds. U.S. President Joe Biden calls Likud party head Benjamin Netanyahu to congratulate him on his election's victory. What did the two leaders talk about? And a new pilot program in Israel launching to make autonomous public transportation a reality. An Israeli resident of Dumim, who was injured two weeks ago in a terrorist attack in Judea and Samaria, died from his wounds early Tuesday. The 55-year-old victim, identified as Shalom Sofil, was stabbed in the Al Funduk village two weeks ago while exiting a store. He was able to make it to his car and drive to a nearby junction where he received medical attention from Israeli security forces and was then evacuated to the hospital. But his condition deteriorated and he succumbed to his wounds. Security forces arrested the Palestinian attacker following a brief manhunt in the area. According to the Israel Defense Forces, the incident was described as a terror attack. And in other news, U.S. President Joe Biden called Likud party leader Benjamin Netanyahu on Monday night, six days after his election's victory, that will likely see him back in the prime minister's chair. In a call that lasted eight minutes, U.S. President Joe Biden congratulated Benjamin Netanyahu on his success in the November 1st elections. Biden told Netanyahu that, quote, we are brothers, we will make history together, end quote, adding that his commitment to Israel was unquestionable. In response, Netanyahu thanked Biden for his personal friendship spanning 40 years and for his commitment to the state of Israel. Netanyahu added that it is within their reach to obtain additional peace agreements between Israel and Arab states and also to deal with the Iranian threat. Since the elections, Netanyahu has received a slew of calls and congratulations from world leaders welcoming him back into power, including from Ukrainian Prime Minister Vladimir Zelensky, newly elected UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, and French President Emmanuel Macron, who also invited Netanyahu to Paris. And though U.S. President Joe Biden took the time to call Benjamin Netanyahu, he has been preoccupied with the midterm elections, where Democrats are facing an uphill battle to maintain control of both the House and the Senate. Millions of Americans casting their votes today. How will the outcome affect U.S.-Israel relations? Well, joining us now to discuss is Moshe Chelto, Vice Chair of Democrats Abroad Israel. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Lidor. So I want to start by asking you about President Biden's phone call to Netanyahu. Why did he wait so long uh, to call and congratulate? I don't know if it was so long. Uh, in my opinion, it was well-timed because, as we have seen in the news in Israel, things are still in the negotiation phase, although the results seem fairly certain. But still, it's not quite a, uh, a government yet. Yes, he was, he, he was given the largest opportunity to create a government. But uh, the president and, and uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu have had very good relations throughout the years. Also, when uh, uh, the president was vice president, he had good relations with the family and with Mr. Netanyahu. There's not a problem here. You know, here in Israel, I mean, the Israel-U.S. Uh, relationship is, is always sort of an issue. Is Israel an issue at all in the voters' minds when casting their ballots today? I don't think so. Uh, I think that people will probably hold on to their uh, uh, pre-election opinions about Israel and about uh, the American uh, administration's support of Israel. There are people who uh, uh, support the previous government in Israel. There are people who support the future government in Israel. And I imagine people had their opinions let's say, about the, the upcoming government before it's even created. So it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, as we know, in the previous elections, the Jewish vote in the United States in 2020 was approximately 75 percent Democrat and 22 percent voting for the uh, incumbent president at the time. 
uh, and those pretty much run very uh, 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 parallel throughout the years. There, there hasn't been much of a change in that for the last eight years. So I don't see any real changes. You know, the Democrats uh, facing an uphill battle, initial polls showing that the Republicans are likely to gain the majority. I mean, why do you think this is the case? Well, we, everyone, I'm, I'm sure that you've heard in the news, has mentioned the fact that this is a, a given, that incumbent uh, presidents will always be losing some of their majority to the, uh, to the other party or to the other side. In uh, my estimation, in front of, I've been, from what I've been listening to on, T, on American TV, uh, the, it's very likely that the Senate will remain in Democratic control. It is possible that they might lose uh, just enough to lose that control. But so far, it looks like the Senate will remain. The House of Representatives is expected to be lost to the Republicans. And the, the main goal of all Americans uh, who are voting Democrat, and even Americans in Israel who are either are voting or should vote in the next few hours Democrat, uh, it should be to make sure that that is as minimal as possible so that voting isn't in this midterm about uh, the president directly. It's about the Congress. It's about uh, uh, voting rights. It's about uh, all sorts of things that are uh, up for grabs. And even on the state level and local level, there are things that must be decided by the voters. For instance, things that never used to be considered uh, serious are all of a sudden very important. The Secretary of State of any given state who is elected now can overturn the elections in 2024 and, and give whoever they want the, uh, the, the, the vote, even though they didn't actually win the election. And we have 60% uh, of Americans will have an election denier on their ballot. And they have to understand that a Secretary of State who's an election denier who has or has his doubts or her doubts about the election results of 2020, you can pretty much... Uh, foresee what might, ha what might happen in 2024, and that will be a very dangerous step for democracy. You know, how will a Republican majority, uh, you know, affect U.S. relations with Israel in terms of Iran, in terms of the Abraham Accords, and in terms of U.S. policy towards Israel in general? Well, I think we've seen uh, already with President Biden's uh, visit to Israel recently We've seen how things have been working out. Uh, uh, I, I don't foresee any real problems. As I said, uh, President Biden and, and Mr. Netanyahu have worked uh, in the past together. They know each other's views on Iran. There is possible new information that could uh, become available as we move along. It doesn't seem that we're about to uh, get into the actual uh, agreement that was uh, being negotiated. But that doesn't mean that things will necessarily change. And since uh, uh, that visit, we have the, up the up uprising, uh, the unrest in Iran of many of the citizens. And this isn't about, uh, 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 this is something which is quite different because it's not just a union or, or, or workers of this kind or of that kind. This is the entire general public who are, who are protesting about the treatment of women and their liberties and, and civil rights in Iran. And it's not coming from the outside, it's entirely internal. So that's pretty much a, 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 an unknown right now. All right, Moshe, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. My pleasure, thank you for having me. And moving on to Israeli politics, the coalition talks continuing to progress with high hopes of delivering a government even before the negotiation countdown begins. And despite a couple of obstacles, right-wing party leaders expressing optimism that a full right coalition is on its way. ILTV's Aaron Porras with the update. In reported efforts to replace Prime Minister Yair Lapid's cabinet as soon as possible, incoming Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu apparently proposing a two-stage coalition agreement, the first stage being the formation of ministerial and parliamentary positions, and the second stage being with negotiations over government policy, which would follow the swearing-in of the 25th Knesset. Major coalition partners Betzel Smotlich and Moshe Gafni refusing the plan, however, putting the pressure back on establishing typical agreements. With respect to policy, both Gafni and Smotlich likewise demanding a so-called override clause that would grant the Knesset the ability to supersede high court rulings that strike down laws. They would also want the override to be possible with a simple 61-vote majority. Though at Netanyahu's apparent request, neither of the party's officials commenting on the discussions in public. 
Now, in talks on ministerial positions, Netanyahu and Otsma Yehudit leader Itamar Ben-Gvir from the Greater Religious Zionism Faction, publishing for the first time a photo of them together. Netanyahu notoriously careful in crafting his image, strictly avoiding any photos with Ben-Gvir on the campaign trail for fear of driving away more centrist voters. In any case, the shot taken during their 80-minute coalition meeting, in which Ben-Gvir repeated his demands to be public security minister, as well as demands to give his number two either the education or transportation portfolio. Ben-Gvir saying that without these ministries, as well as written agreements on judicial reforms and government issues, quote, there's nothing to enter the government for. Meantime, in a recent op-ed, Ben-Gvir attempting to allay fears of his inclusion in government and policies. The controversial MK explaining that he's softened and matured since his early years, and that he's calling on everyone to give him a chance, writing that we are all brothers, and if you listen to the content of my words, you'll see that we agree on 90% of the issues, including the protection of all Israeli citizens, from soldiers and police, to LGBT protesters and victims of violent crime sprees in the Arab-majority communities. And Jewish residents of Judea and Samaria overwhelmingly cheered the Netanyahu-led coalition's election victory and its imminent return to power. Most people in smaller communities voted for the religious Zionism party, and now they are expecting campaign promises to be fulfilled. More in this report from Steve Leibovitz. Israeli voters who live in Judea and Samaria have been frustrated and angered by the security situation. They voted largely for the religious Zionism party, which promised to improve the situation, and that party will soon become a central part of the Netanyahu-led government. These ideologically motivated Israelis see themselves as pioneers in redeeming the biblical heartland promised by God. Now they're expecting increased budgets to help their communities thrive. Gives me more hope uh, that things will change in the state of Israel towards being a more Jewish state, uh, more of a settling the land of Israel state. I hope I will be not proven wrong. Peace talks between Israel and the Palestinian Authority have been dormant since 2014, with no sign of their revival. Most of these residents say that the security situation is intolerable and strongly oppose the creation of a Palestinian state. We've been suffering uh, Arab attacks, Arab violence, Arab bullying, jihadism on the roads, and we feel like with this new government there'll be uh, a rectification of that situation and there'll be an opportunity to build up a deterrence that the IDF and the police in Israel, I think, have lost. Residents realize that moving forward, their security will largely depend on the Netanyahu-led government policy and not campaign promises. And speaking of campaign promises, Likud party leader Benjamin Netanyahu not wasting any time in trying to put together the next coalition. So joining us now to discuss the latest in Israeli politics is Mitchell Barak, political analyst from Kivun Strategies. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Netanyahu holding meetings with all the right-wing political parties, finally releasing a photo with Itamar Ben-Gvir. What is the significance of this photo of the two of them? Well, he's playing to his base here, but he's kind of painted himself into a corner. The uh, the old Netanyahu, the typical Netanyahu, would have been he campaigned to, you know, form a right-wing government and really put the country back on course. Uh, but similar to what he did when, when uh, Bennett and the Jewish Home Party were running, what he would normally do is now leave them in the, in, freeze them out and try and move towards a national unity government which it was rumored that uh, President Isaac Herzog is trying to promote. So I think in deep down, he doesn't really want this government, um, even though he campaigned that he wants a right-wing government and this is what the people want. Uh, he realizes he will have some limitations uh, internationally uh, in governing and also domestically, it would be much better if he could get one of the center parties, whether it's Yeshatid of Yair Lapid or the Mamlakhti party of Benny Gantz, but this is close to impossible, given the history between these men and given, you know, what they have publicly said about Netanyahu and their campaign promises that they would not sit with him. I will say that I do like to say that uh, from the campaign trail that Israeli elections are very much like Las Vegas. What happens in Israeli election campaigns stays in election, Israeli election campaigns. And, you know, what people say 
is not really relevant to what happens the day after. So the, the game is wide open. It is possible that there will be some breakthrough. I mean, we did see that Mansour Abbas did say that he might be willing to join the Netanyahu coalition, again, as an outsider like he did the last time. So he may see some surprises, but Netanyahu realizes he will have a challenge governing, whether it's a 64 or 63-person uh, coalition, when it's very much Netanyahu, uh, Likud, the Tsiunuta Datit, and the Haredi parties. I mean, as you mentioned, you know, Netanyahu is in a difficult spot in terms of forming, forming a coalition that's, you know, not too extreme. He's already tried to calm the waters, and now we've seen Itamel ben Gvir penning an op-ed in the Israeli daily uh, Israel Hayom trying to offer an olive branch, so to speak, to those on the left, saying that his views are no longer so extreme as they once were. I mean, is this really the case, or is this just sort of, you know, a political spin? Well, I think the real political spin is what we've seen of Itamar ben Gvir up until now, meaning up until now, he's never really run anything. He's never run any office. He's never, you know, I, I don't, you know, has he managed anyone? Has he managed something? Even, you know, he threatened that he was going to start his own political party and his own faction, his own list, but he really didn't want to run alone. So what he's been really good at is getting in television studios, making some outlandish statements, getting attention for himself. Well, now he's going to be in government or we think he's going to be in government, he's going to be a minister. He's got to do something. He's got to accomplish something in a ministry. So, you know, his, his success at, you know, fomenting uh, anger or uh, being divisive is not going to get him reelected. He's going to have to show something at the end of whether it's one year or four year term of running an office. And even though he says he wants the public security ministry, uh, he has little to no experience there. And the, the uh, possibility of failure in that ministry, meaning that there won't be calm in the streets, that there'll be continued terrorism and crime, will not be good for him in re-election. Similarly, you know, I'd like to remind everyone that Avigdor Lieberman in one of the elections campaigned on, as soon as he is appointed defense minister, the Hamas will be finished in 48 hours. Well, in 48 months, he wasn't able to wipe out the Hamas. So the same is true of Ben Gvir. He's going to have to really uh, moderate his expectations and pick a ministry or a group of ministries of offices where he can actually show results. And he's going to have to get to work. And being the, you know, the, the class, uh, um, you know, the, the, the person who's the troublemaker is not going to make him successful and not going to get him reelected. So he's going to have to readjust what he's been doing, I think. And we'll see a different Itamar ben -Gvir probably now than we've seen up until now. All right, Mitchell Barak, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And we'll continue to keep an eye on the coalition talks as they progress. Thank you so much. And now, oil and gas producer Energian announced on Monday a major discovery of around 13 billion cubic meters of gas off the coast of Israel. Aaron Porras reporting. Energian announced the commercial discovery of natural gas at its Zeus exploration well and has upgraded its estimate of the natural gas found in the neighboring Athena well as well. Energian has been exploring the area off of the coast of Israel dubbed the Olympus area, which is located between the flagship Karish gas field and the Tanin gas field. Energian saying it found some 13.3 billion cubic meters of recoverable natural gas resources at the Zeus site as well as an additional 3.75 billion cubic meters of gas at the Athena site, increasing its initial discovery to 11.75 billion cubic meters. The company has said that it expects to progress its field development plan, taking into account the new discoveries at Zeus and Athena by early 2023. Last month, the company announced it had reached first gas at the Karish field, Energy and CEO Matthias Riga saying that following the start of production from our Karish Reservoir last week, I am pleased that our drilling program, which has now delivered five successful wells from five, continues to deliver value, ensuring security of supply and energy competition across the region. Meantime, some potential waves at the Sidon Kana field, of which 17% extends from Lebanon's territory into Israel's. French company Total Energies, which has rights to extract from the field, has agreed to the Maritime Demarcation Agreement, which includes compensating Israel for that 17%. But Total Energy's Italian partner, Eni, was not included in the negotiations at all and has yet to sign on. Eni holds a 40% stake in the Sidon Kana field as well as veto power, meaning it could theoretically cause serious upsets in the newly signed agreements. 
And now moving on, President Yitzhak Herzog is warning of a climate calamity in the Middle East. Speaking at COP27 underway in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, Herzog told world leaders that Israel is ready to help lead the way to environmental solutions. More from ILTV's Steve Leibowitz. The Middle East teeters on the brink of climate calamity. That's the blunt message from Israeli President Isaac Herzog. This home we all love is also a global hotspot for climate change, with studies forecasting imminent severe consequences of our region. The Middle East is on the brink of catastrophe, and you could have heard it in the speeches of my predecessors. Herzog committed Israel to be zero-sum emissions by 2050. Here in Sharm el-Sheikh, I wish to reiterate the State of Israel's solid commitment, as relayed last year in Glasgow, to achieving net zero carbon emissions and to transitioning from fossil fuels to renewable energy by 2050. Herzog told world leaders gathered in Sharm el-Sheikh that Israel is ready to lead the effort to climate resilience in the region. But Israel is prepared to assume far greater responsibility. Israel is prepared to lead the effort towards regional climate resilience. I intend to spearhead the development of what I term as renewable Middle East, a regional ecosystem of sustainable peace. Herzog opened the first ever Israeli pavilion at a COP summit. On the sidelines of the conference, Herzog held diplomatic talks with Jordan's King Abdullah. After the meeting, it was announced that Israel and Jordan will sign a memorandum of understanding to complete two joint projects. One relates to Israeli desalinization of Mediterranean seawater for Jordan, and the other, a Jordanian green energy project from solar power for Israel. And speaking of innovation, your first autonomous bus ride may be closer than you think, as Israel's first autonomous buses are making their way to Israel's roads. The details in the following report. In a major step towards advancing autonomous public transportation in Israel, the Transport Ministry, the Israel Innovation Authority, and the Ayalon Highways announced the names of the four companies that will carry out the autonomous bus project. The winners are Eged, Metropolin, Dan, and Native Express bus companies. The 61 million shekel pilot program is expected to have autonomous buses on the road in about two years' time. The pilot program will be launched within the coming months in two stages. The first will see the winning companies carry out pilots in a closed experimental area and in operational areas with the aim of proving technological regulatory safety and business feasibility. During the second stage, the companies will operate autonomous bus lines on public roads. The initiative is designed to address one of the biggest challenges facing the state, traffic congestion, as well as help state and transport authorities cope with the problem of driver manpower shortages. The new pilot program is amongst the leading worldwide and will hopefully pave the way towards autonomous buses as the new norm for public transportation. And now, turning to sports and a great accomplishment for Israeli long-distance runner Lona Chimtai Salpeter, who finished second in the prestigious New York Marathon. The Israeli runner finished seven seconds behind the women's winner Sharon Lokti of Nikenia. Chemtai Salpeter clocked a time of 2 hours, 23 minutes and 30 seconds. It was a tight race until the 28-year-old Kenyan pulled ahead of the Israeli in the final two miles and set a course record. In July, Chemtai Salpeter claimed the bronze medal during the women's marathon at the World Athletic Championships in Eugene, Oregon. A native Kenyan, she became an Israeli citizen in 2016. She moved to Israel in 2008 to work as a nanny, took up running as a hobby, and later married her Israeli coach. Congratulations to her, quite an accomplishment. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. The forecast calling for scattered showers and cloudy skies this evening with lows averaging 14 degrees Celsius or 57 Fahrenheit. And then tomorrow we can expect top temperatures of 23 degrees Celsius or 73 Fahrenheit, along with more cloudy skies and scattered showers around the country. That's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our website, ILTV.TV, and subscribe to our newsletter, as well as our streaming platform, ILTV+. 
I'm Lajar Gravelazi. Be well and thank you so much for watching.